First, I want to uh, welcome Walter Jones. Many of you will recognize him or know him. He is a talented musician that plays on our worship team often. He is father of Pastor Kimberly, um, and he loves God's word and God's people. And this morning, he's going to come up and share with us, continuing our series on uh, loving God and one, and one another as we look at the Ten Commandments. I'm going to invite Walter up in just a moment, but first let me um, read our scripture reading for this morning. This is from Exodus 20, verses 14 and 15. You shall not commit adultery, you shall not steal. It's a short one, that's why I did it this morning. Walter, over to you. All right. Praise the Lord this morning. I'm a Baptist preacher. Um, actually, I grew up in Turner Station, Maryland, and the church was um, um, a Baptist church, but they call it a Baptocostal. But because um, it was like that. Um, it's a privilege to be here this morning to share with you. Um, it's always good to come here to worship with my daughter. It's um, funny to see her sometimes leading worship when I see her as a little two-year-old singing. She was, we used to sing, um, what was the song? From? It was a little tape out that time, Charity Church Mouse. And she would say, praise the Lord. She had a deep voice as a little kid. And, and it was funny now that she's a, she's a worship leader. So little, that little charity church mouse tape in, uh, affected her. Um, so, and God obviously has a call on her life. Today, I entitled this message, Living in the Beloved Community. Living and the beloved community. We're going to look at commandments 7 and 8 and, and try to make, get some understanding. And my hope is that whenever we leave church, that we have something that um, my mother used to say, or actually my, my, my wife's mother used to say, when I go to that church, the preacher always says something that upsets me. And... And, and it, was, it was a good thing because it helped, helped her think about, shook her out of the regular everyday life and, and made her think about God and others. So I hope that happens for you today, that you're upset a little bit um, or upset enough to think about what God is saying to you and what God wants you to do in this world. Um, I want to start with a story from... The book of John, the 8th chapter, and the 3rd through 11 verses, um, if you want to look it up, you can. The Bible says that Jesus was teaching, and the Pharisees, the experts and the teachers of the law, brought him a woman who had been caught, it says, in the very act adultery. I want you to imagine for a second, public, these group, I'm assuming it was mostly men, but there may have been some women there, and they brought this woman, and she had been caught in the act of adultery. So she was probably pulled from whatever she was doing. She wasn't probably properly clothed, because I'm, I'm sure those people who brought her weren't concerned about that. They wanted to shame her. And these Pharisees, these were leaders. These were people who were community leaders, as well as, you know, religious leaders. So they bring this woman out, and they know the law, because in Deuteronomy, the law that they stu had studied that if you're caught in the act of adultery, you bring the woman and the man. So I can imagine some folks were saying, 
They got her. Where's where's the man? Where's the guy? And some who probably knew what was going on probably said, well, you know, um, this again, I'm using a little bit of my uh, uh, anointed imagination, I'll say. They probably said, well, you know, um, you know, he he puts in a little extra when we get together, you know, and um, we don't want to ruin his reputation. And um, he's trying to do better. But, you know, she she you know, you know her, you know how women like this are. We, 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 let's see, let's see what Jesus is going to say. Because you know, if, um, if Jesus says a wrong thing, he may lose some of his crowd. And that may be a good thing. But if he, if he condemns her, yeah, he may lose some of his crowd. But if he says, let her go, he's breaking the rules. He's breaking the law. We can get him. And so they bring this woman and said, Jesus, uh, we caught her in the very act. You know, the law says she's supposed to be stoned to death. And I imagine some folks who heard this and saw the gathering started to pick up their stones, getting ready for the action. And says Jesus bent on the ground and started doing something in the ground, and we don't know some speculate that he was probably just trying to draw the attention away from this scantily clad woman, or maybe she was totally nude. And Jesus says, um, well, he who um, is without sin cast the first stone. And the crowd heard, what did he say? What did he say? He said, if you haven't sinned, you can throw the first stone. What? What, you, what is he talking about? And the Bible says the oldest begin to drop their stones and walk away. The oldest down to the youngest. Some speculate that some of the oldest and some of the youngest had been with the same woman. And they didn't want it to come out. And they were gone. And Jesus says, woman, where are your accusers? And she probably looked around, probably covering herself. And they're gone. And Jesus says, neither do I condemn you. Go and, and sin no more. Don't get into this mess again. And the woman leaves. Jesus, as you see, looked at this broken community. Because anytime you gather people like we gather, somebody in here is broken. And one of them is standing up here. <laughs> Jesus, God has always been trying to build a beloved community. As we look at the scripture, it says, you shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. And Jesus responds to the Old Testament, those Ten Commandments, and he puts a new perspective on it in Matthew 22, 37. He says, of these Ten Commandments, you shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the greatest and most important principle and first commandment. Hmm. Loving God with all your heart, your soul, and your mind. And the second is like it, he says, you shall love your neighbor as you do yourself. That is, you should unselfishly seek the best and higher good for others. The whole law and the writings of the prophet are summed up and depend on these two commandments, Jesus said. God has been always at work building a beloved community. How do we know that? 
Well, we know it by the work of Jesus. We know it by what, how we deal with, how we are in our lives. We hear God. We see God, we feel God, and we know God, and we receive God through scriptures. We know through Christian scriptures and other scriptures from other religions. They talk about community. The law is there to remind us how we fall short. And I know in this existence, not only in Christianity, but I don't know if it's so much more a Western way of thinking. We, we want the world to be organized in the sense that you're good or you're bad. There are few in between, but most of us are good and most of us are bad. But God understands that that's not how human beings are made. He made us. We are complicated. We are complicated. So he tells us, don't commit adultery. That's a law he sets up. But we know today, what I think the statistics are somewhere around 60% of men and 40% of women are involved in adultery. What is adultery? Well, let's define it this way. Being unfaithful to any married person in the marriage bed to share your body or give your body to a person that's not your married person, your wife or your husband. But 60% of men and 40% of women, so we're, we're missing the mark. But God understands. As we see, the penalty was death. If that was a penalty that God would just come and throw lightning bolts, a lot of us wouldn't be here. Tough subject. How many of us commit adultery in a different way? What am I saying? Many of us don't commit adultery by, say, what a big percentage, by sleeping with someone or having sex with another person who's not our wife. But we do it in other ways. We commit ourselves to other gods. We commit ourselves to pursuing gods of money, the god of other people, the gods of things, the gods of fame, the god of sex, the god of addictive su substances. And let me back up a little bit. I'm getting ahead of myself. Let's talk about this adultery, the giving our body part. I think we put so much emphasis on it because it's something that's deep about sharing your body. We're, we're, we have a few kids in here, so I'm going to be careful with my language. But there's something about the human psyche that um, when we share our body, it's is connected with some core stuff. That's why, um, you know, if you've had, you have sex with someone, it makes it, it's like you're giving away more than a, a kiss or get a card or a gift. You're giving something that affects you. And many of us may would, would testify it affects us for life because many of us sometimes remember our first lover. And if that person, or when, and usually when that person hurts us, it's like we've given up something so deep. But I'm here to say the, today that God knows all this. God understands all this. And like he treated that woman who was called in adultery, um, I'm not going to condemn you. Condemn you. Go and, and don't do this again. Don't let it become your lifestyle. But why, God? Because God understands that something deep that happens when we have sex or we share our, when we, you know, when we commit adultery, it, it can ruin the very core inside of us. 
And many of us have experienced that until we've gotten out of that. When we are addicted to serial affairs, we are addicted to pornography. When we are addicted to um, just the idea of ruining our lives. You know, sometimes we're addicted to, some, I, I, I've talked to a friend who said he's addicted to shame. He does things to, so he'll feel ashamed. So it's something that's deep that happens when we have sex with another person. So we shouldn't take it lightly. Now let me move on from that. So I want you to think about that. But I'm going to move on from uh, our addictions to other things. Like many of us are addicted to money like that. That we'll, we'll pursue our, use our time and our energy, just go after money and forget all else. That's why I think sometimes we have people who, they have so much money that 10 generations ahead of them, their, their future generations, will not have to worry about, for, want for anything. But yet they hoard their money and they don't give it away. They don't give, you know, some of it away. You don't have to keep it all. Give it away to somebody who needs. Share it. But some, and some of us also are addicted or we, we, are, um, we go after God, the God of fame. Some of us can't wait to be with a famous person. I was at a, at a um, I was preaching at Morgan State University a few years ago. And when, when Obama was president, and I asked a question to the young college audience, if a homeless man who smelled came into the congregation this morning, or, in a, or Obama came in, which one would you welcome? And everyone, oh, of course, Obama. Because many of us want to be with the famous person. We don't have a sense of, well, the, the le- let's, let's reach for the, the lower person, the least, or the person we, can, we judge as being least, the one who may need the most but we want to be with the famous person. So we're addicted to fame. We want to, we are, we, are, we are adulterers to fame, to things. I know some of us, um, I'm a car guy. I love my two, my, my two old raggedy cars, but I know enough not to spend Sunday morning shining them and washing them. Um, um, but I need to be in church and sharing with, sharing the word of God. But, Adultery, again, is not just to another person, but when we go after things that are not God. Let's talk about theft for a minute. You shall not steal. I'm going somewhere with this. I know I'm rambling a little bit. Although most of us think of theft in terms of material goods, there are treasures we steal from others that are more valuable. Stealing a person's good name or lying about a person to sustain a rumor. In high schools, and I'm a a retired teacher, I've seen it so many years, middle school and high school, people would run lies about people and they don't see their friend right there with them who is falling apart because somebody telling a, a lie about them. We steal their good name. Another way we steal from people, we steal their dignity by a public or private humiliation of that person. I witnessed it so much. Again, I was a school teacher. I witnessed it because I pay attention to how parents treat children. And I'm sure you've seen in grocery stores somewhere where a parent will say some of the meanest things to their child. And the child's right there accepting it, you know, because, um, you know, your children, you mom and daddy are gods, and you're, they know everything you, you tell them, so you, you, you listen to what they say. I had one of the most um, hurtful things. I was a special ed teacher, and I had uh, a little boy in my class, third grader, and he was having a bad day, and, um, and we, had to, to, we had to go down to the office. And the principal said, call, Mr. Jones, call his, call his father. And I, I said, um, I looked, I said, I can't find his father's number. And I said, do you know your father's number? Third grader. He said, my father? I, I have no idea. 
I ain't seen my father. I never saw my father. Uh, okay, okay. And I said, your mother? Yes, that's Miss So. And I called her, and her response on the phone was, pardon my language, what's that little faggot done now? And he heard it. And he asked me, he, he heard that, I saw him put his head down. And um, he was, it was hard for him to look at me the rest of that day. Because he, the other kids in the classroom had said stuff like that about him too. But I'm thinking that's the way his mom sees him? Instead of saying, Mr. Jones, what can I do? What happened? Can we? That's, what, that's her first response. Humiliating him. They're, he's old enough to understand what's going on, and he's taking that on. He's taking that and he's carrying it with him. Stealing his dignity. Jesus brings good news because we get a lot of hurt in this world. Jesus brings us good news and guidance about living in the beloved community. As he, there's an example we saw with a woman who was caught in adultery. Jesus says you should love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. How does one access and perceive this love? Well, I believe one way we do it, we surrender control to God and waiting for God to fill up the gaps of time. And that's a hard thing, I think, for, I, I haven't been anywhere, so I'm not a traveler, haven't been traveling. But I, I think I've interacted with other cultures he, here in the United States who are not Americans, I guess. And Americans like to fill up gaps of time, don't we? We, we can't, I know, I'm, and I'm, I'm part of it. I, I, it's hard to go home sometime and just sit and not turn on the TV. Not see what's on the radio, on, on the, I'm saying the radio, but see what's on my phone. But we surrender control of our lives to God. We let God fill up the gaps of time. Yes, thank you. Yes, we, we sit quiet enough to say, hey, I should call so-and-so. I should, um... I should do that. I should go out into the garden. I should walk my dog. I should pay attention to this thing that's been hurting in my, my belly and go to the doctor. Some people think that's super mystical, but it's just slowing down enough to hear what God is. I think what God is saying. But there's things that are happening that we don't take time to pay attention to. Let God take some of your time. Another way we give, give control to God is by sitting with our fears and uncertainty and just sit with them for a while. Turn off the news when you hear hor horrible things. Turn it off and sit and deal with, how do I feel about that? How do I feel about where our country is going? How do I feel about how they're treating this group of people? How, and, and, and accept, I don't know the answers. And trusting God. Again, I think we, as Americans, we want to have a quick answer. Because I know, like, with, for example, I, I was suspecting when the pandemic hit, my thought was, okay, in two or three months, they'll, some smart guy from Johns Hopkins will figure this out. And then, of course, four months, five months, a year, two years. It's hard for us to stop and accept we don't know. It's, it's this not knowing thing that it's hard for us to to do. But when we wait on God and let him work with us, we can accept more of the mystery. The mystery of life. And that's what life is a lot of mystery. We can heighten our sensitivity to his presence by being quiet. I heard this story one time of how uh, another culture, when they get older, and I know I'm, I'm 67, I got old, and I thought about watching my parents get old. A lot of older people in our country, and, you know, Americans, we, we 
I'm going to get this ca- ca- Cadillac I never had. I'm going to get this I've never had. I'm going to go do, we heard the movies, what's it called? Um, it's called, um, when you, you what's, the, what's it called when you do your final trip or your bucket list? But I heard some cultures where the person getting older, they start saying, I'm going to start giving away these valuables to someone because I'm not going to be here too long. But many of us want to spend our money on a bucket list. I've heard, I've heard in conversation my wife and I were talking about we sitting around this to older people. I'm not going to save this money. They're going to go spend it up. I'm going to go do this and do that before they, you know, <laughs> so their kids won't have it. <laughs> but that's a different mindset to say, hey, let me um, experience God. Let me experience God and accept this mystery that one day I'm not going to be here. I wonder what it's going to be like. It takes a lot to have that attitude, I tell you. Well, we begin to see God on my right, on my left, above and beneath, inside, outside, around me, in my suffering, in my joy, in my victory, and in my defeat. In my life's transitions, in my life's final transformation. Can we begin thinking like that? That's what the beloved community is about, is that accepting that this is an arc. We're not going to be here the whole, all the time. We even though we're living older, to be older, we're not going to be here forever. But many of us are putting it off. Putting it off. We're living longer, but we're putting off this idea that what can I do to give to others? To let his love, God's love, transform me. It's love that I, I read about in this book called Breathing Underwater by a guy named Richard Rohr, some of you may be familiar with. It's something that we allow to happen to us when we let go of our sense of trying to control our lives and let God direct us. And I, I, I've experienced it somewhat, but it comes in drips and drabs. Very few of us get it right away. When we are no longer um, trying to make this happen or make that happen, well, we experience God who wake us, he wakes us up in the morning and sends us off to do this or that, to change our attitudes about things we've held on through, on to for most of our lives. Some of us, our attitudes ch- have changed by sometimes some by force, like some of the social mores in our country. You know, where when um when first I, I'll I'll take this because it happened in my church that I um was ordained in in my twenties. First, there was an argument about well, well, should a gay person be denied work because they're gay? And my thought at the time was. Well, I know in, in my church, there were a lot of adulterers. And no one said, oh, if somebody committed adultery, they shouldn't get a job. But over time, people changed and said, no, we shouldn't allow gay people the right to work or apartments because they're gay. But now we've moved to the point where we are, you know, people love, people grow, people change. And people are learning about their sexuality, learning about who they are, and are not being afraid of it. Because a part of it, I think, is we've been afraid of, of, of like, it's going to, chaos is going to happen if a man holds hand with another man or a woman holds hands with another. Oh, the world's going to fall apart. It hasn't. We have to let God fill in those gaps. Our, mis- our un- misunderstandings. And I'm not telling you how, what to think about it, but just let God let you love people and ask them for love with that, you, that you don't have. And so I know I, 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 I'm, I'm, I was one of those people, I, I, didn't, I didn't understand. So I was like, I wanted to be simple. But as I've gotten older, it's gotten, it's gotten more and more complicated. That's why I believe in that when the woman was caught in adultery, the older, older men walked away first because some of them, had, yeah, I was, if they'd have caught me, I'd be dead now. Because they had been caught, they had been probably adultering or whatever they wanted as well. Jesus guides us 
to a community of loving people, empowered by a loving God. He was the example. Because they expected him to say, uh, yeah, stoner. Stoner. That's what the law says. But he gave them a different answer. He was basically saying, if you haven't done anything, you, you have a right to throw a stone at us. According to the law, but there's a different law. There's a law of love. There's a law of love. And the law of love, Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. That's what he said. Many of us wish that the scripture would be, just be tolerant. Let them stay out of your way. You stay out of their, you stay out of our way, we stay out of your way. That's what people like to, I think a lot of us would like to treat people who we don't agree with in America. You stay out of my way, I stay out of your way. But that's not how Jesus teaches us. He teaches us to love. Today, I think we place so much emphasis on the individual personality that we have lost sight of the individual's vital need for community. So we see what I believe, what I think is so important that I can live without other people. Many times we think we can because I'm, and I talk to a lot of young folks who this thing can take you anywhere in the world this very minute. I don't have the Wi-Fi one now, but I could go to Italy by typing it in and find out the weather in Italy and then type it up news story. But somehow this, I think, gives us a false sense of independence, false sense of, of um, individuality that makes us think, we don't, I don't need anybody. I can make it. Got a little bit of money in the bank. I have a quick example. My daughter, um, Kimberly's older sister, went to Carnegie Mellon one night around, Fran remembers, around about quarter to 12, she had, was coming across campus. Of course, I'm, I'm in Baltimore. She's coming, Daddy, I just want to talk to you. I'm, I'm coming across campus. I was in the library studying. I just want to talk to you as I'm coming across. Um, and I'm thinking, what? Because my daughter, Kimberly, uh, Carmen, her fist is about as big as two of my fingers. <laughs> She's a little, little teeny thing. And by then, she probably weighed 110, 117. And I'm thinking, um, Carmen, take some friends with you. The phone, this phone is not, you need to put the phone and run to your dorm room. But I think we get a sense that we can, we're, we don't need others. But we need people. It's, we have a vital need. When you, when you guys, when we stood up to greet everybody, it was a party in here. Because there's something about human, uh, human being, uh, human, humanity, we like folks. Sometimes we don't like them, that's part of it too. <laughs> Sometimes we, okay, y'all get on my nerves, y'all go somewhere, talk to you later, but go somewhere right now. But that's how we are. We need each other. And as God builds this beloved community, we begin to accept those things. We need to accept those things. How do we beloved, how do the beloved access the beloved community? I said it already, but I'll say it again. A willingness to forgive one another. How many times? Jesus says what? 70 times 7. So forgiveness is the cement in this community. Forgiveness for what? Forgiveness for being so full of ourselves. A willingness to give others and uh, forgive others and uh, f for not being everything we think we need and desire. Let me speak over that a little bit. Because I think, again, we want our mates even, our husbands or wives, we want them to be everything. But as we get older, we know they're not everything. <laughs> Sometimes they don't smell the way we want them to smell. I'll be straight. Sometimes they don't do what we, sometimes they don't put the dishes where they're supposed to be. Sometimes our children don't act. It's, it's, it's anybody. We, we want them to be perfect. We want the world to be tailored for us. And we, have to forg we really do have to forgive people for that. That they're not who, but because why? Because really the only person can satisfy our needs of God. And, he, and you know how he does it sometimes? By sending you those people around you. I, I work with alcoholics. 
And they, they say, sometimes I need to see a Joe, for example, because Joe makes me work on my resentment. I don't like the way Joe sounds. So when I see him, I know I have to work on me. God sends Joe into the room sometimes to get on my nerves so I can work on my resentment. And I think that's, that's part of learning how to live in this beloved community. We need to forgive, forgive ourselves as well for not being God. Many of us are frustrated with ourselves. Because we, we didn't live up to, I got this education, but I'm not, the, I'm not making a million dollars. I've did, done this, but I'm not, doing, I'm not where I want to be. Forgiveness is the cement in the beloved community. I want to read you something from an AA book that really helps me. This is called The 12 Steps and 12 Traditions. Um, I read a book a long time ago that said, what, what, what alcoholics can teach Christians? And this is from the 12 and 12 and, and chapter 10. It says this, finally, we begin to see that all people, and you'll see how this is, effect, this is about the beloved community. We begin to see that all people, including ourselves, are to some extent emotionally ill. Can I get an amen? <laughs> when you get older, you accept that sometimes I'm not right. <laughs> I'm, so I'm a little off with me sometimes. My wife and I joke all the time about that. As well as frequently wrong. And then we approach true tolerance and see that real love for our fellow, what, our, what real love for our fellow really means. It will become more and more evident as we go forward that it is pointless to become angry or to get hurt by people who, like us, are suffering from the pains of growing up. We have a God who's a father who has a bunch of children who are growing up. We're growing up. Again, I'm going back to that woman caught in adultery. The oldest probably left because they realized, yeah, when I was 25, I would have thought I would have been caught in sin, but I would still think she deserved it because she got caught. Now, they didn't catch me. But we realize as we get older that um, I'm not right all the time. People deserve a break. People deserve a second chance. Welcome. How you doing this morning? Welcome. We're all growing up, and we have a loving father who helps us. God has always been at work lovingly in creating his beloved community. We hear God, we see God, we feel God, we know God. We love God as we receive God through sacred scriptures, through relationships with members of the beloved community. There's a preacher in town that says, if it ain't about a relationship, it ain't about nothing. That's what church is about, relationship. If it ain't about relationship, it ain't about nothing. Relationship with God, relationship with the other folks. And I'll repeat this. Many times, my answers to prayer, God sends another person. I ask God, do this and do that for me. Okay, go talk to so-and-so. I want you to give me the answer. No, you need to go work it out with another person. We are called to follow the example of Jesus, who perpetually commune with the Father. That's what we need to do, spend more time with him. And then went out to boldly love people. Not love them from a distance, but to extend your hand to someone you're afraid of, maybe. I'm not saying go and get a, a dangerous situation, but I'm saying you're afraid of in ways that you, this person may not like me. This person may not be my kind of people. Extend your hand to people who are different from you. 
Jesus loved people despite their wickedness, despite their shamelessness, despite their ignorance, despite their willfulness, despite their woundedness. That that would be all of us. We're wicked. We're shameless sometimes. We're ignorant most of the time. We're willful. That's how we're taught to be. And we're wounded. Jesus taught that love in the form of forgiveness was a cement that held the beloved community together. He taught that forgiveness was a love power that emanated from God. He taught that the beloved could avail themselves to this love power as they surrendered their lives and yoked together, connected with him, and connected with each other. I challenge us all today to connect with somebody. Have a tough conversation with somebody that um, you're having a little trouble with. I bet God will be in it. And the first, I, there's a commercial about having a, it's a teen commercial, but it's like it's, 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 to me it spoke so well that sometimes you just got to sit beside the person and say, um, let's talk about, I think it's about suicide, but it's how you feeling? And sometimes we don't expect, sometimes we say that not really expecting an answer. Do it this week and try to see how somebody really is feeling. How you feeling? And you may get some answers that surprise you. But don't be afraid. Let God fill in those gaps. I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of this or that. Let, let, let the person talk. And you be willing to, to share how you really feel. And sometimes I know I'm afraid to say Say how I feel because I'm going to feel I might, I might fall apart. But it's okay because I believe God will hold you up. And I believe he surrounds you with people who will hold you up. Amen? Amen.